in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 1, our text today brings to our consideration the subject, the hope, the riches, and the power. And our particular contextual passages are verse 17 and following. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding, or literally, kardios, the Greek word for heart, of your very being, the eyes of your being, having been enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward, who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the body, the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that fills all in all. The apostle here goes from the subject of our last study, which happens to be the believing in Christ and the acceptance of the word of truth and the gospel of redemption and the sealing of the Holy Spirit into the practical application of what this means to us as believers in Christ. And he says, the Father of glory is giving to those who call upon him the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. In other words, if we desire the spirit of wisdom, if we desire the knowledge of God, it will come by revelation. Now there is such a thing as natural revelation or natural theology. An individual may look about him and see the sky, he may see the stars, he may see nature, the intricacies of nature herself and also of our own bodies, the working of the human mind. And he may deduce from all of these things, as Romans 1 points out, that God does exist, that the Father of Spirits is real, and that he has a possibility of a relationship with him. This is natural theology or natural revelation. But all the natural theology and natural revelation in the world will not bring an individual to saving faith in Jesus Christ. This must take place by the revelation of God to that individual's heart through the Holy Spirit. We must be summoned by him, for many are called but few are chosen. And so Paul says in verse 17 that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of himself. Of course, here we are seeing that revelation is not the revelation of the natural world, but revelation is the revelation of God personally to the individual's soul. Romans chapter 1 reminds us once again, God has revealed this to us. We are not left in darkness. We are not left in a chaotic and purposeless universe. We are not left in the midst of a madness of what the existentialists call the futility of living. No, we are living in the world of the God of purpose, as we have seen in previous studies. The God who has summoned us according to the purpose of himself, the purpose which works all things after the counsel of his own will. We have seen also that God has not left us comfortless, but he has sealed us with his Holy Spirit of promise. And the Spirit of God dwells within us, and we are literally the temple of the living God. We who have consecrated ourselves and given ourselves totally to God's great revelation in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the Apostle Paul, picking this particular theme up once again, says that the knowledge of him is by revelation, and that he by his grace has revealed himself to us, for the purpose, verse 18, that the eyes of our hearts or of our emotional and spiritual nature, having been enlightened, something which has already taken place, we may then come to know the hope, the riches, and the power. Now, what are these things? Well, the hope of his calling. Now, the hope of God's calling in Jesus Christ is as clear as clear can be. Later on in the epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 4, verse 4, the scripture says there is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling. We are called into the body of Christ by the sovereign decree of God. 
that we may understand and appreciate the hope of his calling, that we may know that because he has called us to life in Christ, there is hope in the midst of futility. There is comfort in the midst of sorrow. There is power in the midst of weakness. There is deliverance under the assault of temptation. The hope of his calling is the glory that because he, by his sovereignty, has called us to life in Christ, he will also preserve us. As Paul once again reminds us, he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, or at the day of Jesus Christ. The hope of his calling is that we may understand and know and appreciate the fact that God has selected us. We are his children. We have the inheritance of redemption. We are the purchased possession, verse 14, and we exist to the praise of his glory. Paul says, do not cease to give thanks. He doesn't cease to give thanks for us. We ought to not cease giving thanks to God. Make mention of you in my prayers, he says. I am making mention of you constantly in prayer. So also we are to make mention of one another in our prayers. Pray for one another that we may be healed. We confess our faults to one another that the Lord may by his great and divine cosmic catharsis cleanse us afresh from sin by the blood of Jesus Christ. The Father of glory has vouchsafed to us the knowledge of himself. The eyes of our hearts or souls or very beings having been enlightened through the Holy Spirit of promise that we may know and appreciate the hope of his calling, to know that we are not without hope. I'll never forget reading in 1 Thessalonians a passage which came to life in my mind as never before when I was standing in a great crematorium outside Calcutta, India. The particular passage was the words of the Apostle Paul to Christians who were sorrowing about the death of loved ones. And Paul said, we are not sorrowing as those who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, those also who have fallen asleep in Christ, God will bring back with him. And I thought to myself as I saw a young man stretched out there, 28 years of age, about to be cremated, and his sister lying across his chest and weeping and bathing his corpse with her tears, and others standing around crying and wailing in this terrible scene of abject despair and futility and abandonment. And as these poor souls stood there, how I longed to be able to speak their language. How I longed to be able to tell them, do not sorrow, for there is hope. There is hope for you, the living, that you may find him who is the prince of life. The hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And as I looked upon these people in these burning guts, as they call it, or the crematorium over there in India, I could not help but feel we are not sorrowing as ones who are hopeless, but our hope is in the calling of God who calls the things that are not as if they were and who commands the light to shine out of darkness and has commanded the gospel of Jesus Christ to illuminate our hearts and lives that we may walk with him and that we may be heirs to the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We cannot fully understand the meaning of this phrase, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, for God does not reveal this to us. But we do know that everything which God possesses, all of the things which are his, all of those treasures and riches of his wisdom and knowledge and power and grace are available to those who have put their faith unreservedly in the person of Jesus Christ who, as the Bible points out, is God's only method for making men holy and acceptable in his sight. We have the hope of his calling, but let us not rob ourselves of the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We can build upon the foundation, Jesus Christ. As Paul tells us, other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, Christ Jesus. We can build upon this foundation, but we can build gold and silver and precious stones or we can build wood and hay and stubble. The scripture tells us we are to build 
the gold and the silver and the precious stones of a life which is sanctified and set apart to him, of a testimony which is scattered abroad throughout the earth because of his grace. We can build upon this the love and the joy and the peace and the long-suffering and the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We can build the gifts of the Spirit. We can build a pattern of good works which will testify to the fact that God has redeemed us fully in the person of the Lord Jesus. These things we can build upon the foundation. And as we build upon these things, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints becomes more and more apparent to the life which is yielded to the Lord Jesus. The hope of his calling, ah, yes, but the riches of the glory of his inheritance. It is said of God in the scripture, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. It is said of him in the scripture that the treasures of the hail belong to him. It is said of him in the scripture that he commands the constellations and that the entire universe coheres by the word of his power. All the riches of creation are at his disposal. And beyond this, the riches of the infinite eternity which he has prepared for them that love him. And all wonder of wonders, Paul says, we who are the heirs of the hope of his calling are also joint heirs with Jesus Christ of the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. We will be his most priceless possession and all that he has becomes ours by faith in the Lord Jesus. And then Paul concludes with verse 19 of chapter one. What is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The joy which must have burst forth from the soul of the great apostle as he meditating upon what Jesus Christ meant to him, a redeemed Jew and former persecutor of the Christian church, the exceeding greatness of his power, that God could save Saul of Tarsus, that God could save a Philippian jailer, that God could save a Mary Magdalene, that God could save all mankind who are willing to believe the riches of his grace in the kindness which he has shown us in the person of Jesus Christ. For the grace of God has appeared, says Paul, for the redemption of all mankind, teaching us that we are to abandon the ungodliness and the evil of this world and anticipate that blessed hope, the appearing of the great God and of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The exceeding greatness of his power towards us power which has raised us from our sins, power which sustains us in the midst of temptation, power which is able to crucify the flesh in our own lives and to make us alive anew in the Lord Jesus as we yield to him. Power, power, power. This is what the world worships. But this power, the power of God and the salvation and transformation is available to us by faith. It cannot be coveted it cannot be conquered, it cannot be purchased, but it can be prayed for, and it is available. And so we have in Jesus Christ the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and the exceeding greatness of his power towards us, who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead, set him at his own right hand, in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named not only in this age, but also in the ages which are to come. He has put all things under the feet of the Lord Jesus, and hath given him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and the greatness of his mighty power, ours, because of the fullness of him that fills all in all, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Grant Almighty God, our Father, that we may exult and rejoice in the same message which Paul believed and proclaimed, and help us to see afresh thy great and glorious grace, which has made it possible for the chiefest of all sinners to come face to face with thee and have access into thy presence by the blood of Jesus Christ. Grant that any person here who does not know 
the hope of thy calling, does not know the riches of thy glory in the inheritance of the saints, and who has never experienced thy mighty power to the salvation of their soul, that they may find this today as theirs, through Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. We come to the conclusion of our study of the fourth chapter of the epistle to the Ephesians. Our theme today is speaking the truth in love, verse 15, connected with verses 31 and 32. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. In our previous study, we saw what it meant to be sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, sealed unto the day of redemption, to be an individual who has put away lying, who has put away anger, who has put away thievery, who has put away corrupt communication, a person who has laid aside the old nature, the things according to the corrupt desires of the flesh, and has been renewed in the spirit of the mind, a person who does not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, whereby we have been sealed unto the day of redemption. Now Paul gives this specific commandment. He says, speaking the truth in love. Now what precisely does this mean? Well, in verse 25 of chapter 4, we find another phrase that bolsters this particular concept. Putting away all lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Now, in the 12th chapter of Romans, verse 5, it is pointed out that the Christian is a member of the body of Christ, that a Christian is more than just a membership in a church, but a Christian is an individual who has received of God a union. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophesy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Or ministry, let us wait on our ministering. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Or he that exhorteth on exhortation. He that giveth, let him do it with simplicity. And he that ruleth with diligence. He that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one towards another with brotherly love in honor, preferring one above the other. Now, in Romans chapter 12, we have a parallel to what Paul is speaking of in Ephesians chapter 4. He tells us to speak the truth in love. There are some people who say the truth hurts, and it's quite true. Sometimes the truth, when it is bluntly stated, does hurt. And one thing that the Christian church could cultivate today, and Christians in particular, might be what has been called sanctified tact. In other words, when we are going to speak to someone about a particular instance, we ought to speak the truth, but in the tactfulness of love. Now, there are other individuals who say, well, love demands that when we speak the truth, that there be no hurt to the individual. Now, this other side of the question simply is not true, because Jesus Christ was incarnate love. And love, when it does express itself, and truth, when it is proclaimed, invariably does cause dissension and does cause division and does cause difficulty in some specific context. Because the Lord Jesus Christ, when he walked among us as the Son of Man, and of course as God incarnate, was walking love. He was the very incarnation of the love and the nature of God himself, for John reminds us that God is love. And yet when Christ was here among us, speaking the truth in love as the supreme example, we can see that sometimes love itself in its very essence and truth when it is proclaimed most fearlessly can cause a great deal of wounding and hurt to certain individuals. You will recall the Lord Jesus Christ rebuking the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees on numerous occasions, and he re rebuked them in love. He spoke the truth in love, but it was a rebuke. Love, you see, can not only be that which brings a person closer to you by the fact that you are telling them of your deep concern for them, but love can also be a catalyst. It can also point out to an individual their own desperate need. 
faithful, the scripture says, are the wounds of a friend. And sometimes when the truth is spoken in love, it does wound and it does bring a person to the place where they have to face the issues which are challenging them at that specific moment. To speak the truth in love, Jesus Christ often rebuked. And sometimes we must rebuke in speaking the truth. And love is no less love when it rebukes and exhorts than when it proclaims and when it is conciliatory and brings the individual into a deeper personal relationship both with one another as members of the body of Christ and above all with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul says, speak the truth in love and grow up into him in all things which is the head, even Christ. If Ephesians 4.15 is telling us anything, it is telling us that speaking the truth in love is a form of maturation, of growing up into him in all things, into the Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole body is joined together and compacted, so that we as members of the body of Christ are constantly in the process of edification through spiritual growth and maturity. It makes an increase of the body, verse 16, unto the edification of itself in love. We are not to walk as the Gentile world walks. We are not to walk in the open deceitfulness and hypocrisy of a world that talks about loving when in reality it is speaking only about a veneer. We are instead to speak the truth in the love which Jesus Christ expressed in his life and in his death for our sins. Returning to Romans 12 to look at this parallel again, the scripture says, let love be without dissimulation. Let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be the very essence of the character of God. Abhor that which is evil. This is an outgrowth of love and cleave to that which is good. Abhor is a very strong word in Romans 12, 9. It literally means to have hatred for that which is evil. There's a very good parallel to this particular section of the Word of God in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. Here the Christian who is to live in the world as an emissary for Jesus Christ is adjured, encouraged, instructed by the Holy Spirit to have a particular attitude which that individual is to manifest in the world. I cannot help but think that the Apostle when he was trying desperately to convey to the Thessalonians in the light of their persecution the grave difficulties and conflicts of the age in which they lived, that he was not in his apostolic office gently reminding them, as he says, to test everything, verse 21, and hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from all appearances or forms of evil. Do not despise prophesying. Do not quench the spirit. Give thanks in everything to God. And if you do these things, if you abstain from all forms of evil, the very God of peace will sanctify you wholly. And our whole spirit and soul and body will be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who will also do it. Now, it cannot be more strongly emphasized from 1 Thessalonians 5 or from Romans 12 that the Christian who is to speak the truth in love is to understand the nature of love. Love can be corrective. Love can be disciplinary. Love can take the form of repulsion. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. If we truly love the Lord our God with all our heart, our soul, our mind, and our strength, and our neighbor as ourself, we will hate and turn away from all forms of evil that would in any way jeopardize the fulfillment of that commandment in our own lives. In that sense, love is discriminatory because love for God and for our fellow man causes us to withdraw from and have a strong antipathy or hatred for anything which would destroy that relationship. Also, love is positive in that it causes us to cleave to that which is good. To cleave means to literally be attached to, not to be pried away from, but to hang on tenaciously to that which is good. I think the best illustration that we could give of this 
is something that I learned when I was studying in general science in high school, something which I have never forgotten, the force of magnetism. Our particular professor at that time wanted to demonstrate to us the invisible power and force of magnetic waves. And he took some shavings of metal origin and spread them over a piece of paper. And then going underneath the paper with a magnet, he directed the invisible magnetic waves through the paper onto the metal shavings. And it was so interesting to see on the surface of this white paper the shavings of metal moving as if by some invisible hand until they assumed the pattern of the magnet. And I thought to myself, of course, at this particular juncture in my life, I wasn't thinking of it as a sermon illustration, but I thought to myself, how interesting that an invisible force of such power can be exerted and can actually work in front of our eyes what looks to be an inexplicable miracle, something beyond the force of nature. And yet, actually, it was one of the forces of nature, magnetic induction and force. And here we had magnetic waves attracting the metal and bringing them into the form of the magnet itself. Now, the scripture says, we are to have love without dissimulation. We are to have love that shows itself in mercy. We are to have love that produces kindly affection one towards another in honor preferring one another. We are to be polarized by love so that as those shavings were brought into the form of the magnet, so we who are many should be brought into the form of Jesus Christ who attracts us as the divine magnet and the force that attracts us is love. We are to abhor that which is evil, that is, we are to turn away and to be repelled by that which is evil, and we are to cleave to that which is good. We might say to be magnetized to Jesus Christ, to be so closely drawn to him by the force of his love that we will automatically be repelled by that which is evil. We know that opposites attract, and we know that the, those like forces repel each other. Well, our nature is a sinful nature, and we are attracted by the holy nature of Jesus Christ simply because he, the divine magnetic force of love, if you will, is capable of bringing us to himself by that power whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. So we can see in Ephesians chapter 4 the great emphasis that the apostle is placing upon speaking the truth in love. We must not only proclaim the love of Christ for a lost world, we must not only be magnetized to that love by the purging in ourselves of those things which are in the eyes of God unholy and which cannot edify or build up, but we are to manifest the truth and the love of Christ by laying aside, verse 31 of Ephesians 4, all bitterness, all wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking, to put them away from us with all malice, and to be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. We are to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. Does this not remind us of the great prayer that Jesus Christ taught his disciples to pray? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive us, said Jesus, as we forgive those who trespass against us. The essence of love is to forgive as Christ has forgiven, to be kind one to another, tender-hearted forgiving one another, even as God, for the sake of Jesus Christ, has forgiven us. Speaking the truth in love is to manifest Christ in you, the hope of glory. Our Father, we thank thee for thy word and for thy power which is able to transform and to polarize and magnetize us unto thyself by the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray that thy word may touch the heart of those who listen to this broadcast, that those who know thee not may be born again into thy kingdom, and that those who do know thee may be drawn closer with the cords of love to him who was incarnate love 
and is today the one who expresses himself through us to thy glory. Bless us now and thy word in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh -huh.